Hello everyone, my name is Vicki Jones with VMH Magazine. I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Eldrick Taylor regarding COVID-19 and vitamin C treatments, what it does and has done historically for deadly viruses. Right now, doctors in New York City are treating some of the patients with high doses of vitamin C. Based on a New York Post report, this is a practice that's taken place in China, which has significantly helped patients there in China. Here's what Dr. Taylor had to say regarding vitamin C, the health of our loved ones and our health as this deadly virus spreads. Listen in to what he has to say. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Indeed. So there's some breaking news about the immune system. They say breaking news, but it's something that uh, you already know about in terms of vitamin C, the immune system, and how it wards off of uh, various illnesses. Give us a little bit about uh, the vitamin C and the history that you are familiar with in terms of the holistic approaches to treatment. Yeah, well, vitamin C has uh, been known as an antiviral uh, treatment for a while. Uh, it's uh, originally Dr. Linus Pauling and Dr. Klinner were probably the pioneers in this. Uh, Dr. Pauling was talking about using it for the common cold. And Dr. Klinner uh, has done a lot of work with other viruses, uh, from polio to chickenpox to uh, herpes viruses. But uh, yes, uh, vitamin C, it is an antiviral where it will stop viral replication because that's what happens. Uh, it begins to replicate in the cell. But what it really does in uh, these serious infections, like we're dealing with with uh, coronavirus and people being on ventilators, it uh, prevents something called a cytokine storm. And cytokines are these chemicals that can, um, it goes out and destroys tissue and primarily in the lungs and it causes inflammation. And this inflammation and tissue destruction causes the lungs not to be able to transfer oxygen into the blood. Uh, and that's why these people are having to use uh, ventilators that have serious viral infections. So uh, the problem is that humans cannot make their own vitamin C. They must get it from the food that they eat or they must uh, get it externally, either orally or through, um, or through IV. Well, other animals, if they're exposed to viruses or bacteria, they can actually increase their vitamin C production. So that's why it's so important uh, to use vitamin C when we are confronting uh, a serious uh, viral uh, problem like we're, like we're uh, having right now. Now, you, you mentioned a term. <clears throat> now, can you spell that term out for us? Um, you mentioned the term regarding um, what we're not able to uh, produce. Uh, uh, unless we, in terms of vitamin C, but there was another word uh, that you mentioned a few seconds ago. If you could spell that Cytokine. out. Uh, Cytokine. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E, a cytokine storm. And so okay. it's not necessarily the virus that causes the problem. It's what the virus uh, stimulates in their immune system. It, it, it stimulates this immune response. And vitamin C, squelches that immune response. It, it, it tells the immune system not to overreact because the the actual the reaction to the virus is what is what is deadly. The uh, virus itself stimulates this over response of the immune system and the uh, control mechanism is not there. And vitamin C actually controls it and stops this kind of self-destruction that the body is going through. Instead of it destroying the virus, it starts to destroy uh, uh, normal tissue, especially in the respiratory system. Exactly. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Well, mm -hmm. what happens, and I'm pretty sure you're aware of this, this is not, in terms of what vitamin C does, it's not something new to you because of your practices. And uh, quite frankly, you, you wrote a piece for VMA's magazine on the subject including the history and what vitamin C has done to combat uh, viruses. And then you spoke about the body's natural immune system. So for these viruses that are coming up, uh, that's here globally, um, it's, 
it has this stigma associated with the elderly or older people. Um, clearly, we know that, uh, you know, there's been some uh, terrible losses in, in other age brackets. But why is this? Um, it seems to be a bracket of folks with underlying health issues or those that are older. Well, you know, as we age, everything starts to deteriorate. Uh, I mean, you know, it's just all the body systems don't work as well as they used to. And what happens with older uh, people, yeah, their immune system is diminished. But the other thing that happens is they are, a lot of times they are not able to show the signs of an initial infection. Uh, mm-hmm. With older people, uh, a lot of times they, the, the signs of a fever are, uh, and a fever is actually the body's first response, raise the temperature, and that will kill some of the viruses. They're not able to build that initial response, and sometimes the first uh, response they get to a viral infection is overwhelming sepsis. And that means they get total body infection, that the virus is spread all over by the time they first show any signs of, that there's a problem. So that's primarily the problem with elderly uh, people. They they don't show the initial signs. And so by the time you know they're infected, uh, the body is actually overwhelmed. Uh, if you've had an older grandparent or whatever, you know, you can take them to the hospital and they can have something as simple as a bladder infection that when you're younger, you can get over in a day or two with a, a minimal amount of medication. And a bladder infection on the older person can cause them uh, to have sepsis and to die. And we, we've always known that the elderly were more uh, susceptible to complications like pneumonia from any type of flu virus. That's why it's you know, they advocate the elderly to be, you know, uh, more careful in the flu season because uh, they've always been more susceptible to um, to viruses. And this is just seems to be a little bit more virulent uh, uh, on the older population. Exactly. We're talking with Dr. Eldred Taylor, who is uh, regularly speaks about boosting the immune system and what vitamin C and uh, can do for the immune system and, and our uh, natural antibodies for the purpose of boosting their immune system at this time. Right now, uh, some of the doctors have spoken publicly in New York specifically because it's become an epicenter in the uh, United States. They're speaking candidly about the amount of um, milligrams of vitamin C that they're injecting intravenously into patients that come in and how much they do uh, throughout the day. And from some of the reports that have been read, um, they are injecting 16 times uh, the uh, um, recommended amount from a dietary standpoint uh, with these patients. And and from what they're saying, uh, Dr. Weber is one, Andrew Weber, if I'm um, hopefully I'm not mispronouncing his name, is uh, talking about the subject as well. But uh, it's showing a positive effect. Uh, versus not doing this. What are your What is your take on on that perspective? Is there like some quick fix to boost the immune system while COVID nineteen is spreading everywhere, or what do you think? What's your well, opinion? You know, if 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 you are trying to, what's been shown to increase the uh, immune system response is uh, probiotics. Probiotics. Seventy uh, percent of the immune system is in the gut, so. Probiotics help to control the immune system, and that's what we're talking about, not having an overreaction uh, of the immune system. That's what happens with asthma attacks, with uh, allergies. The, the immune system is overreacting, so probiotics can help control the immune response. Vitamin D will enhance the immune system. That's why we're hoping that uh, as the summer months come and more people hopefully are able to go outside, vitamin D from the sun or either taking vitamin D and making sure your vitamin D level is somewhere above 50. You want it to be between 50 and 100 would help to maintain your immune system. And taking vitamin C, and what they're talking about, the recommended daily amount, that is really to prevent a disease called scurvy. So that is to prevent a, a great deficiency in vitamin C. But when you're talking about trying to boost the immune system, Orally, you should take 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams. But when you're talking about trying to deal with a serious infection that you're talking about patients in the ICU or trying to prevent that, 
you need to use higher doses. And I'm talking about 10, 15. And in China, where they had success with uh, getting people out of the ICU, they used 24 grams of IV vitamin C. And the NIH is conducting a clinical trial based on the information that they received from China. They're using 24 grams of vitamin C a day. They're giving 12 grams twice a day IV. And that's what they're using in the clinical trial. And uh, they're basing that off of what was used successfully in China. So from what I saw in the New, New York Post yesterday, they're using six grams of vitamin C. They're using 1,500 milligrams and they're uh, using it four times a day. I would really hope that if they want to achieve success, that they would do what the NIH is, uh, is studying and what they did in China. And the great thing about vitamin C, there's really no toxic level of IV vitamin C. Mm -hmm. uh, we have already seen that uh, some people have tried to uh, take chloroquine, which the president was talking about, and they've already had a death from somebody misusing chloroquine. So, uh, you know, vitamin C is inexpensive. It has shown, uh, it has a history of being effective against viruses. And, uh, you know, that is something that I think should be used, but I, I would hope that they would use the protocol that has been shown to be effective. Right. And as far as vitamin C, one thing I just wanted to do, just take a browse. It seems like that information that came out in terms of uh, what has helped China, uh, and like you said in the New York Post, I saw that same piece um, where they are implementing the, the, the doses of, have ramped up uh, the doses of vitamin C that are going into these patients with COVID-19 coronavirus. And um, they're doing that because uh, this is, like you said, and what's reported here, some of what China used uh, to get their restore, um, get everything back on track to some degree uh, to to those people in uh, uh, Shanghai, I think it was mentioned here. Right, so, Shanghai and Wuhan, where it all started. And China is opening, you know, uh, opening back up public places, their zoo, and that's that was just starting in January, and this is March. And you know what, you know why I'm so uh, diligent about trying to uh, get this started is because they're talking about vaccines that are 12 to 18 months away. They're talking yeah. about drugs that may be 12 months away. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, and we have something right now that we can try that's inexpensive that has been shown to, to work. Mm -hmm. Right. And you said there's no, from from what you shared in, in, in your background and research and understanding and your knowledge in the medical field, obviously, is that there's no toxic levels of vitamin C. Uh, in exactly. That you, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. See, because vitamin C is a water soluble vitamin, uh, it, it will, you will urinate it out if it's too much. And also vitamin C, and the reason why you have to keep giving it is that vitamin C, as it is working, it is consumed. So well, it, it, it's the oxidative, something called oxidative stress, the cytokine storm. So as it is uh, relieving the oxidative stress, the vitamin C is consumed. So as it works, it is being used up. So that's why you have to have enough and you have to have it over a certain period of time for it to uh, be effective because it's not like you can give one dose and, you know, wait a week and give another dose because it's constantly being consumed. So, but, uh, but yeah, there is no toxic, as far as we know, there's no toxic dose. People have given as much as 100 grams of vitamin C and with no toxicity. There's a theoretical uh, association with kidney stones, but that is really uh, that's a theoretical, a theoretical uh, uh, connection. It really is not proven, but, uh, you know, a kidney stone is a lot easier to treat than someone who is on a respirator or a ventilator. Okay. So I do see here where that, um, that testing has begun in the epicenter there in Wuhan, China, where they started, mm -hmm. looks like it began February 14th with the vitamin C, and they'll mm -hmm. complete their testing through September 30th. But again, uh, uh, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, and yeah. uh, their methods actually uh, worked there in China. Again, Dr. Eldred D. Taylor, uh, is, are there any final words that you'd like for folks to know, Dr. Taylor? 
Well, you know, uh, the last thing I would say is that uh, you have a legal right to ask for non-toxic, inexpensive, possibly effective treatments. There's actually a law that was passed in 2010 that said that, you know, that you cannot be denied that treatment. So if you are a loved one of someone who is uh, dealing with this, it's your mother, your grandmother, grandfather, uh, really understand that this could be a treatment and uh, you may have to demand that uh, your doctor looks at this information and provides this to your loved one. So uh, I would just say educate yourself about this. And if you think it may help someone you love, then you need to pursue it. We're talking with, have been talking with Dr. Eldred B. Taylor of, out of Atlanta, Georgia, on the effectiveness of vitamin C, vitamin D, and COVID-19 and some of the proven uh, facts that have taken place in China and would help those uh, at the epicenter there in Wuhan. Thank you again, Dr. Taylor, for speaking with us. We do appreciate the information. We may have to contact you again as we continue to uh, try to put out this uh, awful, awful virus and figure out a way uh, to get people back on track with their health. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you'd like more information regarding Dr. Taylor, his work, vitamin C, and his suggestions, do go to VMH Magazine. Dot com Again, vmhmagazine.com. He has written um, an, an op-ed there for folks to be able to view. And two, link there is his website where you're able to go and find out more information regarding your immune system, your rights, and anything else that you that is relevant at this time to uh, those protecting themselves and their loved ones. Thank you for listening.